one. So I want to do a little bit of a deep dive on a, on a fact pattern that comes up. It's one of the cliche fact patterns in estate planning and probate. And so what I mean by cliche is we see it all the time. It comes up all the time. And the fact pattern that we typically see are the evil stepmoms and the siblings who hate each other. And then I want to add a last one to it. It's where the day before somebody dies, they change their whole estate plan. And so in all three circumstances, this is what usually happens. Somebody who expects an inheritance, so usually that's a kid, um, it might be a sibling, but it's somebody who maybe they were told by a decedent, the person who died, before they died, hey, I'm including you in my will, right? And so for kids with their parents, that's pretty common. So the parents might say, yeah, we're leaving everything equally between you and your sister. And then lo and behold, mom or dad die and everything only goes to one sibling. Or in the case of the evil stepmom, everything, and I pick on evil stepmom, I assume it could also be evil stepdad, so I'm not being sexist here. But in the case of the evil stepmom, the kids are shocked to find out that they're not included in the estate plan. So to say it one more time, mom or dad die and everything only goes to one sibling and another sibling's cut out, or mom or dad die and everything goes to the evil stepmom. So those are the typical fact patterns. And now the last wrinkle is mom or dad die and it turns out they had a whole new estate plan done the day before. Um, now, a lot of times those happen in conjunction and maybe mom or dad had the estate plan that left everything equally to the kids and everyone was just assuming and maybe the family even saw it and everyone, everyone knew what was going on. And then when mom or dad actually died, they pull out a, a later dated will. Now, here's an important point. The reason it's called a last will and testament is because only your last one counts. So you could have them done your whole life. You could have one done on your 18th birthday. Later on, you get married when you're 25, you get another one done. You start having kids in your early 30s, you get another one done. You start, your kids start moving out of the house, you get another one done. You retire, you get another one done. You finally downsize from the big house to the condo on the beach, you get another one done. So, so far you've had like six or seven wills. It's whichever one is the last one. Now, this is important also because here in Florida, it's only the original that counts. So if we know that there's a last one, but it's lost and we can't find it, or all we can find is a photocopy or all we can find is a digital copy, then we're going to have to go back to whichever the last one that was actually signed that's the original that we can find. Now, this is a recipe for disaster because one kid's got this dated will, the other kid's got this one, but they only have a photocopy or heaven forbid, you know, we've got this situation where one of the children or both of the children are upset. Okay. And this is why it's important because once you're upset, then you go talk to a lawyer, then you file a lawsuit. Now we're in litigation and now we're in this, this tragic situation where it might be three to five years of fighting. And at the end of the day, the lawyers are going to make out great. And the family is going to deal with this drama that's going to be ongoing and ongoing. And it might literally tear families apart. Brothers and sisters might never talk to each other again. Um, and, and we've seen worse, right? And, and uh, uh, one of the morals of the story is to be clear and transparent with your kids and make sure that they actually know what their expectations are so that there's not anyone who's shocked. Um, but unfortunately, and I see this with the sibling situation a lot, one of the kids will move far away. Like let's say we're in Florida and they move to California, but the other kid will live in town and actually take care of mom and dad as they get older and actually drive them to their doctor's appointments and be with them to spend time with them. And the other one who's out in California shows up for Thanksgiving every year and that's it. And then they're shocked and appalled that they got written out of the will and they'll try to accuse undue influence, which means we put pressure in mom and dad. Well, lack of capacity, mom and dad didn't know what was going on and we were putting a whole lot of pressure on them to sign these documents and they didn't mean to write me out of the will. Um, accusations of forgeries, right? And so there's all these different little hallmarks of bad fact patterns that can lead to family drama and lots of litigation. Now, if mom or dad is gonna change their will on the day before they die, which by the way, my father had cancer, on the day before he died, he was perfectly competent and he was fully lucid and he could totally make any changes to his estate plan that he wanted to. And maybe if he decided on his deathbed that one of his kids was a good for nothing and he wanted to write him out of the will. Now, if I was the estate planning lawyer doing that, I would follow so many formalities. I'd get a court reporter, I'd get a videographer, I'd ask them a whole bunch of questions to verify their competence. And then I would make sure that it was all like triple witness, double notary, and that way, when the sibling comes in upset that they've been cut out, 
it's there's proof is all there all right so guys hopefully this never happens to any of you if it does please immediately think about talking to a lawyer um, if you have any questions or concerns or maybe you can share a story that's similar leave a comment below thanks guys